Most of my work is about two things. First, how do we achieve change as individuals, as a people, as communities, as the powers that be, as democracies? And the second is, how do people deal with the specific challenges of life? How do people deal with injustice, for example? And both of these issues are very visible, very obvious, very present when it comes to the justice system in America. Struggling a little, people. Do we got it? Yeah, I got it. Um, I wasn't that aware of that when I moved to California in 2017. But within a week, I met a man, Gary Taylor, who had been in prison for over 40 years for a crime he didn't commit. Sounds pretty random, but it's America, so it really wasn't. And we got to talk, and uh, he got me interested, and he connected me to some volunteers in St. Quentin Prison in the Bay Area. And um, these volunteers, they train men in the prison who once a year run a marathon, which is an extraordinary, insane endeavor, because they, they run the same lab 105 times at the courtyard. Um, but it was a way for these men to stay sane. And the record holder for that marathon up until this day had just gotten out a week after 18 years in prisons for a crime he did commit, by the way. Martel, uh, Markel Taylor, with a nickname Markel the Gazelle Taylor, because he was really fast. Um, and I, we met at the Embarcadero in San Francisco, and we walked around, and I wanted to buy him a coffee. And we walked into this coffee place, a chain like Starbucks, and there was nobody there except for a very cheerful college girl behind the counter. And she said, hi, what can I get you? And Markel said, I would like a coffee. And uh, she pointed to the menu over our heads and said, well, what would you like? And Markel looked at it and you could see he went totally blank. Um, you could, see, you could literally see his brain explode with all these options that weren't there 20 years ago when he ordered a coffee. So he randomly pointed at something and said, well, what, what's an espresso? And the girl said, well, it's a really strong coffee. And he said, is there sugar in there? Because I really like sugar in my coffee. And she said, do you have something sweet? And she said, sure, would you like a caramel frappuccino or a white chocolate vanilla latte? And that only made things worse. So uh, we navigated Markel through the menu and we ordered him, I don't know, a, a cake dressed up as coffee, a sugar overload. And we walked to the condiments and he said, I feel so stupid. I can't even order a coffee. And that moment left a mark with me because he wasn't prepared for getting back into society. He wasn't prepared for the small things and he surely wasn't prepared for the large things because nobody prepared him for that. And Markel's coffee is just one of so many examples of the effects of a system that is flawed in so many ways, from investigation to conviction to imprisonment to rehabilitation. And the system and the experience of living through that is exactly what we're going to talk about today. And we'll do that with our honors guests, uh, Ricky Jackson, who was 39 years in jail for something he didn't do, and Mark Kotze, who's the director of the Innocence Project Ohio and a law professor uh, at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. They will kick off with an introduction uh, on, or actually a conversation, an, an introduction on the Innocence Project and a conversation between the two of them. And later on, Bas Kniphorst who will join the conversation. He's an expert on prisoners' rights organizations in the US and the Netherlands. We have an intermezzo. Uh, Martin already told that. We'll get back to that later. It's very on topic. It's something you'll never hear again and probably never heard before. And that's a cliffhanger. But the composer is here and he will explain. And uh, we will finish with the last round of Q&A. So if you're a regular at the John Adams, this is going to be a little more of a free flow movement than you're used to. And that's a lot of room for questions, a lot of room for interactions. And that's not because I'm a lazy moderator, but because this story and these two guys will draw you in. And we want to give you all the opportunity to ask anything you want to ask. So I'm going to start off with a brief introduction of just what the Innocence Project is. And then I'm going to get into Ricky's story. So the innocence movement in the U.S. started in the mid-90s. Before that, we believed in the U.S. there were no wrongful convictions. And as long as there have been prisons anywhere in the world, 
the phenomenon of a prisoner saying, I didn't do this, I'm innocent, I'm in prison for something I didn't do, has always existed. And in the U.S., they would file these habeas petitions to the court and say, I'm innocent. And we had cases go all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where even the U.S. Supreme Court said this idea that someone in prison is innocent, with all the safeguards we have, with all the constitutional rights, is a myth. But then in the mid-90s, something happened. We were given this great gift of DNA testing, all right? And DNA testing was in many ways like a crystal ball because we could look into it and we could go back in time and it allowed us to see what really happened with absolute scientific certainty. And what it revealed was that a lot of these people in prison claiming they were innocent and yelling and screaming actually were innocent. And when you have a system that for decades has thought it was perfect and flawless and all of a sudden you're seeing innocent people on death row um, being proven completely innocent, it's a shock. Um, this started in the mid-90s with the first Innocence Project in New York, and as you can imagine, it got a lot of attention, and Innocence Projects started spreading around the United States, and they're all based on the same basic model, which is law professors supervising law students. And the law students are the ones who are rolling up their sleeves and reinvestigating the cases and talking to witnesses and beating on doors and trying to figure out if these claims of innocence are actually true or not. We founded our Innocence Project in the state of Ohio. And by the way, Ohio is sort of in the middle, a little bit to the east, like the Great Lakes area. Um, we founded it in 2003, so next year is going to be our 20th anniversary. And in those 19 years, we have now freed 34 Ohioans who together serve 600 and 75 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Uh, when I get home next week, we have another person who's going to be freed who spent about 30 years in prison. And the cases, even though we've been doing this for 19 years, it's not going away, it's only speeding up, and our rate of exoneration continues to increase. As part of this movement nationally, there have been now 3,000 people in the United States in the last 25 years proven innocent and exonerated who together spent over 27,000 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And I can tell you that these 3,000 people in this 27,000 years is just the tip of the iceberg. As somebody who's been doing this for 20 years, the vast majority of the cases simply can't be reinvestigated because too much time has passed. The witnesses are dead. The evidence has been destroyed. And it's only a lucky subset of people where we can actually find the witnesses, we can test the DNA, um, who can make it through all those hurdles and all those coincidences to finally be proven innocent. And that 3,000, that 27,000 years comes out of that small subset. Ricky's case, I think, gives us a good um, illustration of how innocence projects work. So I'll, I'll turn to that now that I'm going to bring Ricky up. It was 1975 in Cleveland, Ohio, Ricky had just turned 18 years old. And he lived in a predominantly black, poor neighborhood in Cleveland. And a white businessman was gunned down and killed on the street after coming out of a little bodega, a little convenience store. Um, and of course, this is the 70s, so we didn't have electronic payments and all the things we do now. So his job was to go around to these different stores and pick up the money and pick up the money orders and take them to the bank. And someone knew that he would be coming out of the store with a briefcase full of money that day, and they were waiting outside the store, and they tried to get the briefcase away from him, and they threw acid in his face. And he still would not let go of the briefcase, and so he was shot and killed. As you can imagine, when something like this happens, people hear the gunshots, people come running, um, the police show up on the scene, there's a body on the ground with a sheet over it, and they are um, trying to keep the people back. And a 12-year-old boy named Edward Vernon steps through the crowds of the police and tells the police that he was there, that he saw the whole thing, and he names Ricky Jackson and Ricky Jackson's two best friends, the Bridgman brothers, Wiley and Ronnie, as the culprits. So the police focused on this one witness and continued to work on him for the next couple of days, had him eventually identify Ricky and the Bridgman brothers in live lineups, and the state of Ohio brought charges against Ricky and the Bridgman brothers, got a conviction, and got the death penalty against all three of them based on the testimony 
of this 12-year-old boy at the time of the crime, 13-year-old at the time he testified, based solely on his testimony. It was an all-white jury, and they convicted and sent all of them to death row. An important piece of the story to understand is that um, in the late 70s, the U.S. Supreme Court held Ohio's death penalty statute unconstitutional. And at that time, everyone on Ohio's death row got automatically moved to life in prison. Later, Ohio enacted a new death penalty statute so they could start instituting the death penalty again. But everyone up to that time got moved over to life in prison permanently. And at that time, when that happened, one of the Bridgman brothers was seven days from his execution date. Another was 10 days from his execution date. And Ricky was a couple of months from his execution date. If not for pure luck, all three of them would have been executed back in the 1970s. So they are then moved to life in prison where they spend time, and Ricky will tell you, writing letters to everybody they can and yelling and screaming, we are innocent um, and we were wrongfully convicted, but they fall on deaf ears. We got involved in the case in about 2011, and our first instinct was to look for the evidence, to try to find that cup that the perpetrator was holding that threw the, the acid to do DNA testing. And we found that the, the, all the evidence had been destroyed. It was no longer available. So the only other thing we could possibly do is talk to Ed Vernon, the 12-year-old boy, 13-year-old at the time he testified, now a man in his 50s because almost 40 years had passed. Um, our law students were able to track down Ed Vernon, get his current address, get his current phone number, and they called him up and they said, we'd like to talk to you about that case that you testified in when you were a kid. And Ed Vernon said, I saw what I saw and hung up. So that was the end. I mean, we had no other angles to go through. But we were very concerned about the case by this point. We believed Ricky and the Bridgman brothers. Um, and it was very clear that Ed Vernon had changed his story repeatedly. It was all over the place. This was a case that was raising serious red flags. So we didn't completely close the case. It just sort of went cold. A couple of years later, we get a call in our office from a pastor who says, I'm here in the hospital with a man named Ed Vernon who's dying, and he just confessed to me that when he was 12, he made up a lie that sent three innocent men to death row, and he would like to come clean. So we race to Cleveland, and we get a statement from Ed Vernon. Ed Vernon fortunately survived. Uh, he believed at the time he was dying, but he survived. And we had a recantation, so we had the state's main witness now recanting in the U.S. and in other countries, when a witness recants many years after trial, it's usually not enough to reopen the case because the courts will be very suspicious of it. They'll say, oh, the defendant's family paid him to recant or they threatened him to get him to recant. You know, was he telling the truth then or is he telling the truth now? But we thought that this case had a chance because of the way the recantation happened. We had a pastor, a very credible person, who would be able to come and corroborate the recantation and talk to the court about how it happened when Ed Vernon believed he was on his deathbed. So we went forward and we tried to get the convictions overturned based on this recantation. And just to show you the level of investigation our students engage in, when Ed Vernon recanted, he said, I was actually on a school bus on my way home from school with other kids and we were a couple of blocks away when we heard the shots. And at the next stop, we all got off the bus and ran down there. So our students were able to go to the school, pull the yearbook from his grade, copy all the names of everybody, and we were able to track down other people who were on the school bus who could verify that Ed Vernon was on the school bus with them and that they knew all the time that Ed Vernon was lying. Now, this is a white businessman who was killed in a black neighborhood. We had white police officers, and they told us we were afraid to come forward and interfere. We knew he was lying. Our parents told us to shut up. That's what you did back in 1975 when something like this happened in a black neighborhood in, in Cleveland. Um, but we were able to pr pr go to court in November of 2014 and present the testimony of Ricky Jackson. Ed Vernon recanted on the stand, and he told about how this was a lie from the pits of hell that had ruined his life, absolutely ruined his life. And he gave a long, compelling testimony about how the, actually the police had coerced him. He had tried to change his testimony. He was 12 years old. He wanted some attention. He made this statement. But within the next day, he told the police, I actually made it up. And they started yelling at him and screaming at him and making him stick to his story. And what he did ended up completely ruining his life. And then we were able to also present the testimony of corroborating witnesses who said, yes, I was on the bus with Ed Vernon. None of us saw it. We were several blocks away. 
And with that, we were able to overturn Ricky's conviction and the Bridgman brothers. When Ricky walked out of prison in November of 2014, after 39 years, he set the record for the longest serving person in US history to be exonerated, 39 years. Since that time, our project in Ohio has exonerated someone who spent 46 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Um, I'm going to bring Ricky up. Um, when we were in prison, um, <clears throat> there was so much we didn't know about our case and why we were actually in prison. We knew that we were charged with capital murder. I had spent two and a half years of my life on death row, coming perilously close to being executed. And um, after we were released, released from death row and given a life sentence, um, all I could think about was how much I hated Ed Vernon. And he was the poster child for all my anxiety, uh, my hatred, my loathing. Um, but when the Ohio Innocence Project got on board, excuse me, and took over our case and started revealing some of the things that had gone on that we weren't aware of, um, I came to realize that Edward, as a 12-year-old child, was really just a pawn. I mean, how much control could a 13-year-old child have over the entire criminal justice system, including the police? I mean, he was coerced and threatened pretty much like we were. And so talk about like your, your journey with him. He's in your mind. He's causing all this pain and suffering. He's your focus. Exactly. Um, he was, I mean, he was like that burden on your back that I could never get rid of. You know, I thought about him constantly. Um, honestly thought about if I ever got out how much I wanted to destroy and ruin his life like he had ruined mine. Um, but when I got an opportunity, uh, when I got my freedom, and I realized that he was a victim as much as we were, um, I knew it was tantamount for me to meet Edward and to let him know that um, I wanted to forgive him for what he had did. You know, I had to. Um, he had been such a part of my life for so long, for 39 years, um, and I knew that having given this rare opportunity because in my position, guys don't get an opportunity like this often. And um, I knew that I didn't want to live whatever life I had left on the outside, being worried and hating Edward Vernon. And so um, I arranged through my lawyer, Brian Howe, to meet with Edward. Matter of fact, at this same pastor's church who took his confession, and um, we met and we sat down and um, we talked for about 15 minutes and um, I could see he was afraid of me at first. I don't know if he thought I was going to try to harm him physically, but really I just wanted to meet him and let him know because I had to do this. It was more so for myself than him. You know, um, I knew that if I didn't do this, that I would always be in that state of mind of hatred, loathing, and just, you know, I just had to release him. And the only way I could release him was to forgive him. And so we sat down and talked. And when it was time to go, we, sat, we stood up and embraced. And um, I just felt this sense of such utter relief. And I felt it in him, too. I felt his body grow light in my arms. And I knew that that was the, sig the signal for me to start my new life anew. Without all this baggage that I'd carried for 39 years about this case, about my life, and um, at the end of our conversation, I told him with all sincerity, I hope whatever years you have left on this earth are good and that you're going to have a good life because I intend to. I can't carry you with me anymore. And um, I kept my promise to myself. Since then, I've had a great life. Um, I've been able to do stuff like this, um, come to your beautiful country. I met friends all over the country, uh, my country, all over the world, as a matter of fact. And um, that wouldn't have been possible if I had been a revengeful, hateful person. You know? How about Clarissa? Would you have been able to? No, my <laughs> wife. I mean, nobody would want to be bothered with me because I had so much pent up anger um, about what had happened to me, about my life and how I felt my life had been destroyed. But my life was actually just put on hold. It wasn't destroyed. And um, I wouldn't have been able to do what I do now and have the kind of life that I live now if I did not forgive him. 
you know, so, but it wasn't only solely for him, it was mostly for myself, you know, and more than anything, that helped me to heal, the healing process, to move on a little faster. So, I want to tell you about the, the hearing. This is November of 2014. This is when we're going to court and we're going to present the evidence that Ricky's innocent, that Ed Vernon lied. And it's basically like a trial. And it was to start on a Monday. Oh, thank you so much. It was to start on a Monday. And we had a judge that we thought was a favorable judge, open-minded judge that might actually rule in our favor. But we thought the chances were 50-50. The, the it's very hard to win these cases in court. <laughs> Um, but we also knew the judge was, had already retired, and he was leaving the bench in a couple months, and the judge that was taking his place was going to be very, very bad for us. Um, it was somebody from the prosecutor's office. And so we showed up for our first um, day in court, and the prosecutor said, we have a deal for you. We will drop the charges right now if Ricky agrees to plead guilty to the same charges, and we'll agree that he can be sentenced to time served and he can walk free right now. And the judge looked at us and said, you have to decide, you got five minutes, because if this trial doesn't start on time, I'm kicking it to the next judge. And so we had to go to Ricky. He was in the holding room. He was shackled at the legs and shackled at the arms and say, we, I really hate to put you in this position. You got five minutes. Do you can plead guilty and say you did it and walk free right now, or we can roll the dice and go through this trial and we put our odds at 50-50. If we lose, you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. Tell them what you were thinking at that time. Uh, at the time that you guys were telling me this, it seemed like you said I only have five minutes, but it seemed like five hours. And honestly, um, after having served 39 years in prison, having lost so much, having lost my mom, um, my family shattered, um, it was so tempting. I mean, and that carrot was right there, you know, it was so tempting. I can leave this prison. I can leave this hell today. But I thought about all that I had been through, all that I had sacrificed. Um, and I said, no, I'm Mark, I don't need five minutes. Um, whatever happens, happens. I'm, I can't live my life as a convicted murderer. I just couldn't, you know? That was like being dishonest to myself and uh, living my life as a lie. I couldn't do it. And so I told him, man, let's go out there and roll the dice. Whatever happens, happens. But I'm going to die with the truth on my side. And that's was my position in that, in that decision. We ended up winning. He was freed Friday at the end of the trial. Um, and we told him 50-50. We didn't know. Talk about, um, you mentioned your mother, how she inspired you in prison to stay sane and um, what her words were to you. Before she passed away, she told me, um, I know things look bleak right now, um, but you got to promise me that you will not let these people make you a prisoner. You're not a prisoner, you've been captured. You've been captured, you're not a prisoner. Uh, you didn't commit a crime, and I need you to be Ricky Jackson when you get out, only better. Do not become a prisoner, do not succumb to that prison number. Remember who you are, and remember what I taught you. And, um, I'm sorry. Um, and that was just one of the things that always stuck with me. And um, I just took that and I ran with it. I started educating myself. I started reading books. Um, I kept away from the prison rigmarole, the clamor of prison that guys get so easily sucked into, especially if you're doing a long time in prison. You learn to become a prisoner. And uh, I kept hearing those words from my mother. Don't let these people turn you into a prisoner, you know? And um, that's what I strove to do. Um, I read a lot. Um, I started a lot of prison programs. Uh, I brought the Red Cross into prison. I taught guys how to do CPR. And uh, my main goal and focus was to just keep moving forward, just to keep building on myself and being better and preparing myself to be free, even though I knew it was a possibility that I might not ever be free. But I was always getting up every day preparing for that day when I might be free. When Ricky first got out, he was invited to give a TED Talk at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, probably the most prestigious place in America you can give a TED Talk. And they brought him up for a few days beforehand to um, practice and meet everyone. And the curator called me on the second day he was there and said, 
we gave him a tour yesterday, and I've done the same thing with Nobel Prize winners who have given and former U.S. presidents who have given TED Talks. And Ricky Jackson knew more about the art in this museum than any person I've ever met. Um, talk about how that how you got to that. Well, a little backstory, if I may. Um, even before all this happened in my life, when I was a young kid. Um, I used to go to the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I was always impressed by this big white building with these big stone columns. And um, there was a statue of the thinker outside the, the museum. And I was always fascinated by what's going on in there. Why do so many people go in there every day? And so one day I got up my courage, and uh, there was this troop of school children, white school children, going in, they were lined up about to go into the museum on a tour. So. I just fell in line behind him. I was the only black kid in line, and I just walked in. I didn't even have a school uniform on. <laughs> I walked in, and the security guard looked at me, and he's like, whatever. And um, <laughs> from that moment on, I was fascinated, and I fell in love with art because I had never been exposed to anything like that. And um, they had this cavalry horseman, armored horseman, at the entrance of the museum. and. Um, I was a wee tyke at the time, and this thing seemed so human humongously big, and I was so pressed. It was my best, my favorite piece in the whole museum. And um, fast forward, when I was released from prison, the museum offered to give me a tour of the museum. It had been re revitalized and everything. Um, a lot of stuff had been moved around, but I was looking forward to seeing this cavalry horseman. And, um, to my dismay, when we got to the museum, it was gone. And so I was kind of downtrodden about that, and I pretended like I was really interested in the rest of the tour. But my favorite piece had been, it was gone. And, but they were really playing a joke on me. They had moved it to another location, and they were taking me all around the other ways until we finally got to this room. And when I stepped around the corner, that was my guy. I was a little taller now, and he seemed not as big then, but. It was just a great surprise, and um, that moment, it connected me with my past, you know? And, um, but while I was in prison, um, I had a great love for art and the history of art and the people that created this art, and so I did a lot of reading. Um, nobody in the, ever took art books out of the library, so I had pretty much all of them in my cell, <laughs> you know? And um, I would just sit, look at these pictures and read about the artists and the times and the, and the events that caused these people to create. And it was, to me, it was magical to know that people had this capability to create such beauty and how it lasted and how we were the proprietors of this art. And it was our job to take care of it. And so um, that's why I gained my knowledge of art, you know, what limited knowledge I have, I should say. But, um, Art has always been a big part of my life. We only have a few minutes, and then we're going to do Q&A, right? Um, a couple other interesting things I want to make sure you hear from him. Talk about the sensory overload on the day you walked free and like the differences between prison and then the real world. I think uh, that's interesting for people to hear. I don't know if you, anybody's familiar with the movie Groundhog Day where uh, Chevy Chase relives the same day. That's pretty much what prison is like, especially if you're doing decades. Every day is the same. You know, you can pretty much blindfold yourself and get through your day without a hitch. And that's how prison is. The same colors, the same sounds, the same smells, the same orders every day. Even, even the shades, he's saying, you like know. you only see certain shades of orange, right? Exactly. Like for 39 it's, years. The colors are the same. And so all of a sudden, the judge says, you're free to go. And I step out onto the courtroom steps outside for the first time as a free man in 39 years. And we were downtown Cleveland in the middle of the day. There's traffic, there's gasoline smells, there's cars honking. Everybody's got on a different color. You know, they're not marching in line. And just the sensory overload was so great, I just stood there numbed. And I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. You know, the, the sensory overload was just that tremendous. And I stood there and everybody was asking me, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? And I didn't answer because I wasn't there at that time, you know, I was just floating around looking at it because it was so surreal to believe that I had survived that nightmare and uh, was standing there and um, 
it was such a tremendous feeling, but I could, honestly, I could not move. I was so overloaded, you know, my senses were so overloaded with the sudden change of my world. We ready now? One more. One more. Um, so I, I, talk about the first couple of weeks. You know, we put you up, we, had, we got him a little efficiency, we had a donor. After 39 years, you don't even have an ID, right? It's like you can't even go get a driver's license. Um, sort of what your first reactions were and um, the moment you sort of realized you were free. Um, that first night alone by myself, um, I didn't sleep for five days straight, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, I was up 24 seven. I was so geeked up with adrenaline, I couldn't sleep. And uh, when I finally got a chance and the opportunity to be by myself, um, I just sat there. They dropped me off in my little efficiency apartment and I just, had, I didn't even take my coat off. I just sat on the bed like, okay, what do I do now? And um, it occurred to me like, you know, you can just get up and go where you want to go now. And so that's what I did. I opened my front door, I walked out of my apartment and it was a crisp, cold November night. The moon was full. And um, I think at that moment, at that moment, I really felt free for the first time. Um, being able to come and go as I wanted to and, um, but there was still this, I kept expecting somebody to say, where are you going? Uh, you're out of place. But that, sen that sensation soon wore off. And um, I, like I said, that was the first moment, the first time I really felt that I was totally free. Can you tell them, I want one more quick thing. Can you tell them who lovely Rose Jackson is? Lovely Rose um, is my daughter. She's two, about to be two. Um, it's my first child. I'm an old dad, <laughs> but she keeps me young because she's all over the place. Um, but that's my baby. I have three stepchildren also by my wife, from my, with my wife. Um, I'm a family guy. You know, I love being a family man. Uh, I always wanted to be a family man. And, you know, it's funny because I used to have this dream when I was in prison um, about being a dad. And um, during my pre-sentencing, they give you this test to see if you're sane enough to be executed. And um, during this test, they had me draw a picture. And I drew a picture of a house with a fence around it. And um, this is so weird, but the house I ended up buying resembled so much that drawing back in the 1970s that I drew when they were trying to execute me. It was just uncanny and remarkable. Um, but I have a great life, and I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. Um, if I knew the outcome was going to be this, I would gladly do it all over again. I really would. Um, I have my beautiful daughter, my beautiful wife, my beautiful family. I have a nice home. And it's not just the material stuff, but it's the people I've been able to meet and the friends I've been made, able to make along this journey that has made it all worthwhile. So thank you guys very much. Thank you both so much. Ricky, are those happy tears or sad Definitely tears? Definitely happy tears. Um, I often say to myself, um, I would be truly greedy if I asked God for anything else again in life because, um, like I said, I have everything a man could ever want in life, um, everything I've ever dreamed of. Um, my life isn't perfect, but it's perfect to me, you know? Yeah. And... It wasn't perfect earlier on, and you were talking about the little boy who gave the statement that got you in prison, and you said, I forgave him because I also understood he was a victim of the system. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Can you give us a context of what happened to this boy and the time that it happened in? I mean, um, I understand the police enthusiasm. You got a witness so early on in a, a, a serious case like that, and you want to work the case. Um, but after talking to this kid for like 10 minutes, it was obvious to see that he didn't see what he said he saw. But over the zealousness or whatever you want to call it on the part of the police, they pursued and pressured this young kid. Um, they pretty much kidnapped this kid. He wasn't allowed uh, legal counsel. And his parents were threatened that if they ever got involved or tried to contact them in any kind of way, that they would prosecute them. 
you know. And so it was kind of like bullying tactics on the part of the police, you know, to keep this this child with them at all times. Um, they had him sequestered in a hotel downtown. His parents weren't allowed to be there. And that was illegal, you know, but this was kind of stuff that was going on back in the 70s. And why did it happen like that? And what was the role of race in that? Part, I didn't understand the question. Oh, I'm sorry. What, I mean, it's illegal. Why do they do it? And what was the context? I mean, it was a white man murdered in a black neighborhood. What part was that of the way they treated that boy and they treated you? I think that it was kudos on the part of police to being able to solve a case so quick like that. It was a serious matter. And for them to show that they had the ability to get the perpetrators and um, because they had suspects before us, you know, but when you got this person stepping up and said, I saw it, that's a good piece of evidence. And so they stopped pursuing those guys and start pursuing us and trying to build a case against us through Edward Vernon. Talk about your interrogation. I think that's an important piece of what you're, you're getting at. I think people would be interested to hear. Um, the day after, the next following day after we were arrested, they took us down in what they call the bullpen. This, this is where they interrogate prisoners. And one of the tactics they used to use, at first they, they, they basically written, they wrote a confession for me to sign. And when I wouldn't sign that, they started using physical tactics. And one of the tactics they would use would be to handcuff me behind a chair and they would get one of these old fashioned thick phone books, you know, and they would put it across my torso, put these leather gloves on and pound me in the stomach and chest, you know, hoping that I would sign this confession. Um, and I refused, I wouldn't. Um, and so they got angry and they started putting it over my face. One would hold my forehead back like this and they would put the phone book over my face and they would punch the phone book. And um, one time they hit me so hard, they knocked me out. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was in my cell. You know, I was recovering in my cell. And so I think that kind of scared them a little bit because they never came back to bother me after that as far as trying to sign a confession. I do want to give you guys room as well to ask questions. So if there are any questions at this point in time, please feel free to raise your hand. And I see one in the back, I see many. Okay, you're in the back, Mika, right? Yeah. Yes, first. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for opening up about your, on your really touching and uh, really, I have no words for your story really. First of all, I want to say that. Um, secondly, I have a question about the, um, the hearing in 2014. Um, I'm just so uh, really struck and flabbergasted by the amount of time that has passed between the, the trial in 1975 and the, I don't know how to call it, like the re-hearing in 2014. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, um, in 1975, I feel that there was um, so much less maybe knowledge and evidence about racism in the American incarceration and criminal justice system versus maybe in 2014. Do you feel that there were any developments in, uh, in that sphere and that because there's more statistics about racism and mass incarceration of the black population in America that the facts, or actually the non-facts, but were believed as facts in 1975, a white boy being a witness as a 13-year-old, a uh, completely white jury, um, policeman, trying to coerce the witness into, um, into believing in his own lies. Do you feel that there was more understanding for the complete, actually, really yeah, I understand crazy situation in 1975? Has that developed yeah. in any way, yeah, I mean, do you I think? I think that that's part of it. I mean, I think... Even today, it's hard to get a conviction overturned. I mean, courts don't want to admit that a mistake was made. They're very reluctant. But I think at an intangible level, um, the atmospherics of the situation, I think that had something to do with it. it you could, I think you, people understand and the judge understood that this was a different era and these things they're claiming might not be believed today, but you might be able to believe that it happened back in 1975. Um, and so, yes, I think that did play some role in it. Yes. I think it played a big role in it. Um, in the 70s, we had just come out of the Huff riots. 
which was racially motivated. And um, there was such a dis chasm between the black community, the Justice Department, and the police department in my community. There was no communication whatsoever. We had no representatives on the, on the black side in the legal defense part, the, the legal department, or the police department for that matter. Most of the cops, um, I don't think I, growing up, I ever saw a black cop, you know, or a black prosecutor or a black judge, you know. So race played a big part in why it was so easy to take a minuscule amount of evidence, take three young lives, pretty much destroy them, put us in prison based on the testimony of a 12-year-old child that after talking to this kid for five minutes knew that he was lying. Makes me wonder, how are your best friends doing? Um, they're doing great. One of the brothers died a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but the other is doing great. He has his own innocence project, so to speak. Um, Witnesses Innocence is what it's called. And um, matter of fact, he's director of that program right now. And uh, <laughs> he's doing great. He's doing great. Happy to hear that. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, I don't want uh, to touch on it. It's a sore subject. But Wiley, who, who passed, can you talk about why he passed? Uh, Wiley um, was the oldest among us, and he was one of the people that I really looked up to um, because he kept me and his younger brother on a straight and narrow. You know, he insisted that we have jobs. You know, he was the one that inspired me to join the Marine Corps. And the guy was so brilliant, you know, it was amazing. I guess that's why I admired him so much, because he knew everything about everything, according to me anyway. And to see what the system did to him, you know, um, he just wasn't mentally prepared to accept what happened to him. And so he rebelled a lot. And so in prison, you know, um, the easiest thing to quell rebellion is to they get these guys drugs. You know, and he became, um, he succumbed to these drugs. When he got out of prison, the day he got out, he had so many pills with him, it was just ridiculous. And um, the medication really, you know, helped to destroy his mind, I do believe. Sorry to hear that. There's a question here. Oh, um, my question's a bit towards uh, Mark. Um, what does the Innocent Project do to help those that you get freed, uh, because they have been in prison so long, they're institutionalized. And what what steps do you do to help that? I mean, we've already said it. He said it's so different outside after being inside. Yeah. So we have somebody being released next week when I get home, and um, so a lot of my emails and the things I'm doing those two weeks while I'm in Europe is preparing for a place for him to live and getting his clothing size and going out and getting my employees to go shopping and get him a wardrobe and um, trying to find jobs. And we have our, our major donors who have connections and we, we already have a job lined up for him doing flooring. Um, and we're looking for an apartment. So we have, you know, we don't have all the money in the world, but we have fortunately have a, a fund that donors have created that is enough that, you know, we were able to pay for Ricky for several months. We were able to pay for schooling for some. We were able to do other things. Um, we also have a therapist um, who's a volunteer, but she's basically become our full-time therapist. She does, I mean, Ricky can attest to this, um, group sessions with the exonerees, individual sessions. She's become an expert on PTSD that um, every exoneree has. Um, she's expanded to working with the families and the loved ones of the exonerees to help them understand their triggers. She also counsels our staff. I mean, this is a really depressing job for us. Um, and we nationally, all the Innocence Project lawyers are struggling with you know depression and, and burnout and everything. And so uh, we've been fortunate to have her. So it's, we try to do as much as we can. Nothing could be enough, though, right? If I may expound, because Mark is being modest, you you have to understand they're not obligated to do any of that. You know, they did their job when they got us out of prison. But as an exoneree, when you get out of prison, as opposed to being a parolee where the state will provide you with the necessary means and tools to get on with your life. As an exoneree, they don't, the state doesn't owe you anything. They don't even give you ID. Um, these guys stepped up and volunteered to do this when there was no fund. You know, A lot of this stuff initially came out of their own pockets, like putting me up for two weeks downtown, which is expensive. Um, and a lot of this money 
came out of their own pockets, driving up and down the freeway, making sure we had housing because once they got us out of prison, you know, honestly, their hands were, they'd done their job, you know, and uh, like I say, the state, as opposed, if I'd have been a parolee, if I'd have been guilty, I could have got all that stuff from the state, ID, housing, clothing voucher, food voucher, so they're being modest when they say that, you know, because they've gone above and beyond what their job entail for them to do. You might be interested to know that we had an exoneree named Raymond Taller get out in 2010, and he received a large settlement in his lawsuits, and he bought a house that's called the exoneree house, and now he puts up our exonerees when they get out if they have nowhere to go and pays for all the food and lodging and medical care. Um, and we've had some stories and news articles written about that. It's pretty inspiring. Yeah. We've got one more question before we go to the music, and then you get all the room in the world to ask all your other questions. Ricky, my question is rather lighthearted. This is a great city for art, and since you're here, I wonder if you've been to a museum and if you have a favorite. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. She, she was asking, uh, this is a wonderful city for art, and uh, have you seen one of our museums yet? I've seen several of your museums, and it is. Uh, the Van Gogh, for instance. Um, it's a, it is a wonderful city for art. I mean, the city itself speaks of art, you know? <laughs> so, um, yes, I mean, I was very impressed. I read a lot about Amsterdam, you know, and um, let me say that it lived up to my expectation. <laughs> it did. Well, speaking of art, uh, we also have uh, a musician and a composer in our midst tonight. And I would love to welcome them to the stage. We have tuba player Perry Hogendijk. He's a member of the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra. And we have composer Jacob Ter Welsthuis. Um, Jacob, I would love to invite you to the stage. <laughs> I'm excited for this. Oh. I grew up in the northeastern part of the Netherlands, a province called Groningen. And when I was about 16 years old, I played in my first band. A friend was a steward on the Holland America line, and he bought records in New York City, blues records from Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, Buddy Guy, Big Bill Brunzi, you name it. We were kids, but we were blown away by their music, and we tried to copy it, like so many bands at the time in Europe tried to copy blues and rhythm and blues, etc. In the town where I lived, small town called Winschoten, there was a state prison where about 30 heavy Dutch criminals were kept. One day we were asked to do a concert for them. And it was an incredible experience. Our band sounded so great in the huge hall between the prison cells. And it made a deep impression on me to find out that the guys in there were no monsters, they were human beings. I was only 16, but I was so impressed by that. 30 years later, I watched an American documentary called Scared Straight about juvenile delinquency. Teenagers who had committed small crime were condemned to stay one day in Rawway State Prison in New Jersey where they were intimidated, screamed at, and terrified by the inmates in an attempt to scare them straight. Again, I was impressed also by how these inmates try to survive in a hostile environment that a prison is. And so I decided to write a piece about life behind bars. What do I know about life behind bars? But I wanted to do it. And I used the sound bites, the one-liners, the dialogues of these inmates for the piece. So I didn't write the melodies. I didn't write the rhythms. All that came from the voices of these inmates. I wrote that piece in 1999. It's called Grab It. It's also a kind of carpe diem. That's why I called it Grab It. A carpe diem. 
you know, enjoy life while you can, even when you're in prison. And ever since I wrote the piece, it has been performed. There, there, has, there has been no day without a performance somewhere on the globe of this piece. The original version was for tenor saxophone and soundtracks and video. But then other musicians wanted to perform it as well. So they asked me to arrange it for big band, for saxophone quartet, for rock band, electric guitar, percussion group, string quartet, you name it. And today you will hear a new premiere for tuba, which is quite unusual, and which works, also works quite well, especially because we have Perry Hogendijk here, who is the principal tuba player of the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra. Grab It was performed in the United States many times, but much to my surprise, in the land of the free and the brave, it was censored. First, I wit wit witnessed how it was censored on a college school in Syracuse, upstate New York, where they beeped out every word they didn't like, which I think was a, same, a shame. But then, Ethel, an electric string, string quartet, played it live in Merkin Hall, New York City, and it was in a live broadcast on WNYC, a wonderful New York radio station. Believe it or not, the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, warned the WNYC radio station, one more broadcast of Grab It by Jacob TV and you will lose your license. I hope that the John Adams Institute will not get into trouble now today. <laughs> but hey, we're in Holland, so I, I expect no problems. Ladies and gentlemen, let's listen to Perry Hogendijk on tuba. Fucking now! Motherfucker, burn! 
is what you do when you leave here today. You lose everything. You went out the back door wrapped up in a green sheet with a tag on his coat. Tied one end around the pipe and he hung himself. And when they stuck his dumb ass in the ground and give another one in the graveyard marker, somebody was thrown for one to keep the party going. Just standing around the corner with lipstick on your lips. I've seen it a thousand times. You're gonna walk around this joint, plenty of joints might be in. You lose everything. And when you talk to a fuckers like you, tied one in around the pipe. something Perry? This is quite an intense piece to play. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's it like to communicate with voices though? It, it takes so much time to, to get it so together but, yeah. but um, uh, I, was, I was so grabbed by this piece the first moment I heard it but actually one of my students played it and I, I thought like this is impossible to play and then I thought like ah, but it's, it's so great I'm just going to practice I'm going to practice until I can do this but it takes a lot of hours. <laughs> Well, thank you for all the practice. <laughs> Great bravo, job. Bravo. So, Ricky, what do you hear when you listen to a piece like that? That's so a great Ricky, question. So, Ricky, what do you hear when you I listen to a piece like that? Listening to the voices. That's a great question. Um, but in the background, I, um, definitely reminds me of being in prison. And, you know, the happiness, the sadness, the melancholiness, um, you know, not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring. But... That's what prison clamor is like, yeah. you know, and then to be able to put that to music, I thought was great. That's a know. big compliment. Yeah. I, I also want to invite to the stage uh, our third guest, <coughs> Bas Kniphorst. It's so hard to applaud when you have a microphone in your hand, but you can do it, guys. Thank you. And uh, Boss knows everything about prisoner rights organization because he was on the advisory board of the John Hauer Association in Illinois. And he sits on the board of Bonjo, which is the Dutch largest prisoner rights organization. Boss, okay. welcome. Thank you. Does it work? I think it works, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, we've been talking about America quite a lot. We have, yeah. And you know a lot about that as well. But how are we doing in the Netherlands? I mean, we always think we're doing so wonderful compared to the United <laughs> yeah, States. Yeah, we do. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. I think if we go back to, you know, could innocent people uh, like Ricky, could that happen here in the Netherlands? And the, the answer is absolutely. There are people behind bars in this country who are innocent. And, you know, we've had the Putin Mortzak, we had... Uh, you know, a number of cases, the Carnival Mort and the Showbiz Mort in the 80s, have been a number of um, cases where people have been exonerated. So that can absolutely happen here. I think there are probably three big differences between the US and Holland in terms of 
Ricky situation and Justice, and I think I'd be keen to hear from you, Mark, as well, what you think. But I, the, the three big differences, I think, is firstly, you have right to legal aid in this country where you can essentially hire and fire a lawyer, and that's not a public defender the way we have it in the U.S. Right, because you, Ricky, you didn't have a choice, right? No, I did not at that, unless I had money to hire, actually hire my own lawyer, but um, we were poor, and um, uh, putting together the kind of defense like that costs a lot of money. You right. know, to get a good lawyer, it costs a lot of money. Right. And then I, I'm guessing the lawyer you had wasn't really interested in your case. No, and it, it, he was what you would call a rookie. He had never tried... <laughs> You know, this was his first capital case, and, you know, my life hanged in the balance, and it was in his hands, and he was not up for the job. He tried to recuse himself a couple of times from the case. He admitted to the judge that it was just too much for his, that you know, his skill set, you know. Yeah. So what are the second and the third parts, um, the So the second thing is, in the Netherlands, I think there's more separation of powers when it comes to, if you see in the U.S. sometimes the you know, what we call open bar ministry, right? So the public prosecutor's office, the judge, as well as the police. I think there's more separation there. And tied into that is the third thing, which is we have no um, elected, uh, only appointed judges, police commissioners. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think in the U.S., a lot of the states that have elected officials, it's harder. And I think, Mark, you can probably talk mm -hmm. to that as well. Yeah. It, especially for exoneration, it makes things harder because I think, You've experienced some of the sort of the wacky cases that you you get in the in yeah. the U.S. So the wacky excuses, I guess, they use for why they're not wrong. Yeah, because Mark, you've written a wonderful book, a page turner that's actually for sale right outside there, um, and that's on the question of how do so many innocent people get convicted in the United States? And part of that is because of some systematic problems that you also mentioned. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, there are. I mean, I could pick one of these and I could lecture for two hours on any of these topics, but I mean, what you touched on, um, many of the states in the U.S., the judges and the prosecutors are elected. Yeah. And so it just infuses politics where you have this, you know, everyone wants to appear tough on crime so that they'll get elected. And then it causes this like reflex where they have to act tough all the time. And um, to me, if I could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the American system, I would get rid of the elections. Uh, for judges and prosecutors. I mean, that, that's just touching the tip of the iceberg, though, on the problems. And, and you also wrote in your book about the Napoleon complex of the Democrats. Could you explain that? <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting. In Ohio, it's a, sort of what we call a purple state, so it's kind of evenly split between Republicans and Democrats. And um, you would think a lot of people would assume that the Democrats would be easier to deal with and be more sympathetic to the innocence movement. Um, but in Ohio, it's been the exact opposite. Um, where, you know, where a Democrat is in power in a city and the Democratic prosecutor and Democratic judges, we've had a harder time getting exonerations. We've had more resistance. And it's my theory that um, the Democrats are always painted as soft on crime. And so they followed Bill Clinton's lead of trying to act really tough on crime. And it worked for him. So Democrats started following that model. Um, and so they have like a Napoleon complex or a chip on their shoulder. Um, where they act all, try to act tough at all times. Whereas when I would sit down with Republican prosecutors, Republican judges, even trying to get laws passed, sit down with a Republican senator, much more reasonable and calm about reform uh, than the resistance I would see from the Democrats. And that, yeah. That's my experience in Illinois as well. So I was a, a prison monitor in Illinois, and uh, we, we found a very constructive relationship counterintuitively, I think, with the Republican. Uh, we, had, we found far more willingness to, uh, to go. So it's, it's an interesting topic because it doesn't go down the lines that you would expect, right? It's not, it's yeah. not what you'd expect. And let me add to that, too, that, that um, you know, Kamala Harris, the now Vice President of the United States, her career was as a prosecutor. Yeah. She was famously horrible to innocent people and to in the innocence movement. The Innocence Project in California hated her when she was a prosecutor there. Um, but it has recently changed where the Democrats have finally gotten over that Napoleon complex and in the last couple of elections have been running on very sort of liberal, what you traditionally think of as democratic reform of the criminal justice system platforms and have been winning. So it's starting to go back to what you would normally expect. And if you look at uh, American political ads when they have these campaigns, even the, 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 the politicians that don't really don't have a platform, they can always use I'm tough on crime. I'm going to lock people up. They don't really have a platform other than that. And we have this fear factor in America. And so people are instantly latch on to that. Oh, this guy's going to be tough on crime. Let's elect him, you know. Did, 
did your experience over the last 39 years and maybe after that, did it change the way you look at politics? I mean, as a, as a system, do you still have faith in that system, if you ever had it? I do. I mean, the system, yes, it's not perfect, but it's the system, you know, and it's the people and how they are trained, you know. Um, the system could be worked a little bit, but it's how we train the people. And like these gentlemen alluded to earlier, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on a politician, a judge, whatever, when they're elected in that position. They have to prove to their constituents, you know, what they ran on, the platform they ran on. And so if you take that out of the equation, there's less pressure to conform and get it right, you know. Yeah. Feel free to um, raise your <coughs> hand, by the way. I'm going to this gentleman right now. Ik hou hem vast. Mag jij de vraag stellen? Ja, yeah, thank you. Isn't there a fourth a major difference that uh, uh, that explains the difference between the United States and the Dutch system, and that is the jury jurisdiction that basically makes that lay men and lay women have to judge about a case? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one where I think our opinions we we went through this question and I think we right. have probably different opinions <laughs> did, on yeah. this uh, before. Um, Mark, do you want to talk about that first? Uh... Yeah, so I'm a huge critic of the American criminal justice system, and so there's, I feel no loyalty that I have to say certain things. Um, and, you know, prosecutors and judges in my state hate me because I'm such a critic. Uh, but I would not trade the jury system for anything. Um, if, you know, the defendants in the, in the U.S. can waive the jury and have the judge try them and decide the facts, um, and very rarely does that happen. And the reason why is that the judges, um, you know, it's just human nature. You become institutionalized. You're part of the system for so long, it's like going through the motions. You become very jaded. Uh, you are used to seeing guilty people after guilty person after guilty person. And so um, it's very hard to get them to open their eyes and, and look at it. Jury system's not perfect, um, but you have people coming in. Now, yours is a little different where the racial context of 1975 and an all-white jury and a white man killed and all this kind of stuff. I mean, race can, I, the judges are racist too. I mean, so, it, you know, it's, it, to me, I see more often jurors coming in and this is like my chance and I'm going to focus and I'm going to do a really good job and they don't have that institutional, like the, it's warped their mind through time from being in the job for so long. If I could try my innocence cases, like we had the, the trial for Ricky, if that had been in front of a jury, I would have told them we got a 95% chance of winning instead of a 50%. It was only 50% because we were in front of a jaded judge. Um, and so I, I will take the jury every single day. Let's see, now I'm on an opposite scale. <laughs> <laughs> because I, jury trials are a political theater to me. That's, it's like a TV show. You know, they have too much access to information outside of the courtroom. People are easily influenced. They get instructions every day. Don't go home and talk about the case. Don't read newspapers. Don't get on Facebook. What do you think they do when they go home? You know, people are just too easily influenced by social media now, you know. And they talk about the case. You can't say that they don't. And I think it's just, um, you look at these court TVs now with uh, Johnny Depp and, uh, what's it, Johnny? Amber Heard. Amber Heard. Yeah, this, that kind of stuff there. You know, it's just political theater to me now. People are just too easily influenced. They forget about the instructions they got as jurors to begin with, and they get caught up in the drama too, you know, and just, just too easily. It's about who performs the best in the courtroom nowadays when you're standing in front of the jury, you know. My lawyer came in, he had a wrinkled up suit, his hair wasn't cut. The prosecutor, on the other hand, came with a nice press suit, his hair was cut, and people notice that, and they get influenced by that, and they don't really listen to the facts as much as they listen to the actor. So, Mark, a lot of this, oh, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the things you touch upon, and, and Ricky also with the, with the jury, uh, is about the imperfection of being a human yeah. and all of the biases that come with it. What can you do within, you know, given the fact that we're all human beings and we're imperfect, what can you do within that system to deal with that, to make it better? I mean, this is, this is a two-hour answer, right? I could give a whole lecture. <laughs> the book is about psychology and the psychology of the criminal justice system. And I mean, the short answer is that the American criminal justice system and, you know, the wrongful convictions happen during the investigations, not the trial. It's over by the time they've decided somebody did it and they've collected all the evidence in a flawed way. Um, and it's the same everywhere, regardless of what country you're in. Um, you know, 
it's based on psychology from the 1800s or the 1950s at best. Um, and, you know, I don't want to branch into something that takes 15 minutes, but, uh, you know, it, there's real interesting studies about, you know, the, the malleability of human memory and how easily suggestible witnesses are and study after study, and you see these in these cases. Um, we eventually have to get to the point where we treat the human mind like a crime scene. Like if a crime scene happens now, the police come and they tape it off with the yellow line, the yellow tape, and they don't let people in there to contaminate it. And there's ways you can question witnesses without influencing them. Um, so we have to end up taping off the human mind and making sure we're extracting the information in a proper way. Um, even like forensics, confirmation bias. Um, and, you know, we tell experts the answer before they start their analysis. Um, we expect the, the bullet's going to come from his gun because he confessed. Um, study after study shows that when somebody, an expert, knows the answer before they start, it actually influences what they see. And so we have improper outcomes. These are things that are very easy to fix if you understand the human mind, you understand human filters and how the human mind works. Um, but the criminal justice systems everywhere in the world are still based on psychology from the 1950s at best. Um, so there are very easy fixes to some of these yeah. things that I talk about in the book. And, and that's something that we see in the Netherlands as well. If you see Lucia de Bay, right, the famous case in the Netherlands, same sort of issue, right, where you're seeing the, the, yeah, the, the failings of humanity rather than necessarily the, the, the system. Right? We have a question here. Um, I wanted to thank you for your work, Mark, and also thank you for your vulnerability about all these topics, uh, Ricky. I uh, had a question, if, if it was regarding earlier in your talk, if you can still recall in the earlier years of your um, conviction, if I was wondering how much in the dark you were in those earlier times about what was going on. You know, the, you had the whole system investigating and basically deciding your whole life for you. And you had mentioned that you weren't really informed with what was going on. So I'm wondering, to what extent were you in the dark? And at what point did you really have a better picture of what was actually going on? Um, well, when I was on death row, um, after the, all the appeals or, you know, after, pretty much after you get convicted, your lawyer you disappears on you. And um, if you don't have the finances outside of the support to hire a lawyer to continue to fight your case, um, the information <clears throat> well dries up, you know, and anything you get after that, you know, you pretty much, because um, having the capital case, <clears throat> excuse me, your case is automatically appealed, you know. And so after that process, whether you're granted whatever you're seeking or not, you know, like I said, um, the information well dries up, and anything you get after that, you pretty much have to get on, get on your own. And for um, a lot of years, this is what I was doing. I didn't have the resources or, you know, to get to the law library or anything like that. It wasn't until previous years of being in prison that, you know, we had to fight as prisoners to get an adequate law library so we could get access to law books and stuff like that because that stuff wasn't available in the early, latter part of the 70s and the 80s. You know, we had to fight to get stuff like that. Unless you had the money or the family or the resources on the outside to do this investigative work for you, you know, you were pretty much in the dark about a lot of stuff. I mean, just getting my trial transcripts took me like five years, you know, because as a lay person, the court, you can't petition the court. They don't want to hear from you or, or they brush you off as opposed to being a lawyer where you have access to this kind of stuff. But like I said, um, after my death row appeals and um, I was let off death row, I didn't have a lawyer, you know? And so um, I had the, any information I got up until the point of the Ohio Innocence Project, you know, revealing what they did to me when I was pretty much on my own. And my, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, my resources were very limited. And if we're talking about being in the dark, first this gentleman and then I'll come to you. If we're talking about being in the dark, um, when did you actually understand or really realize what happened to you? Well, when I say being in the dark, I'm saying as far as the particulars. We knew what had happened. We knew who, who had lied on us. You knew what, we knew why we were in prison. But there were a lot of particulars about the case, you know, that I didn't find, find out till decades later on. And it was so surprising and shocking to me that, you know, uh, my life hanging in the balance according to this information. This is what got me in prison, and uh, it wasn't revealed to me until decades later, you know? I mean, you're talking about things like 
uh, Ed Vernon telling that he recanted right away and the police threatened him. Exactly. They had so no idea that it happened. I had no idea about that, you know, none of that. Um, I didn't know about the police lineup, you know, that he never picked this out till years later. Um, it was so, I didn't know about a lot of witnesses, people that had come forward in, in my defense. Um, it was just a lot of stuff like that. I mean, we knew about, you know, the major parts of why we were there, who had testified against us, um, the crime we were accused of uh, committing. But it was just a lot of little stuff that, you know, left the puzzle incomplete. Thanks. Ricky, can I ask you just to describe for the Dutch audience what prison conditions are like in the United States? Because I think that maybe is, is a little bit different from what we're used to. Can you explain, you know, say if you're in maximum security where you started out, right? How many hours you're spending in your cell? What does that look like? Uh, what, describe death row. the conditions on uh, death row, yeah. Uh, I spent two and a half years on death row, and um, we were in our cell 23 hours a day. Um, twice a week, we got to come out, shackled, belly chained, feet cuffed, to take a shower, you know, because on death row, you're considered one of the maximum security prisoners, so you had to be escorted everywhere. And... Um, just to get a breath of air, some guys would go out just to be in the sunshine. Some guys would eat soap to make themselves sick. So because anywhere we were escorted, we had to go outside. We weren't allowed to walk through the main part of the prison because we were, quote, unquote, so dangerous. And so some guys, you know, just to get outside would eat soap to make themselves throw up or whatever just to go to the infirmary. And um, like I said, we were locked down. And at that time, there was no going outside. You know, we had these TVs on the wall, you know, for entertainment, but um, you had to find a way to survive in that cell 23 hours a day. Yeah, I have a question here. Thank you, Mark. Um, two things uh, on the differences between us. Um, do you think there's a cultural difference between the U.S. And, and Europe in this sense? I mean, the U.S. has the highest rate of incarceration in the world per 100,000 people. I think uh, North Korea is, is a distant second. And the second thing is, I think you said that there were 27,000 years saved, well, 27,000 years spent Sir, in prison yeah. uh, for 3,000 3, inmates, which means the mean average is, is nine years per prisoner. And I would have hoped that things would be getting better rather than getting worse. These are not all ancient cases uncovered by DNA. But how do you see this? Are things getting better? Are you an optimist? Um, very, very slowly. I mean, I think wrongful convictions are still happening uh, in the U.S. You know, and I'm working on cases now. I just filed on a case. I think we're going to win it. I think we're going to exonerate him. And he was convicted in 2012. Um, so I think maybe at the margins it's getting better. I mean, I see this as a... There are very clear things we need to do to change the way investigations occur. And this is in America and other places. I mean, if a, if a murder happens in Beijing, if one happens in Amsterdam, if one happens in New York City, the police investigate them the same way. They use the same types of evidence. That's where the problems happen. There are easy reforms, but it's, it's going to be a decades-long civil rights movement of convincing these systems who have done it the same way for decades that they need to change. Um, and so, you know, we're going to see it, but it's just very slow. And we're starting to see, at least in the U.S., more openness a little bit, but there's still a lot of resistance. Yeah. That's my experience in... Illinois as well, and working here in the Netherlands. Um, if you look at Illinois, Illinois has got a population of 8 million, and it incarcerates four times as many people as the Netherlands at 18 million. Right? So you see the rates of incarceration are mm -hmm. much higher. I think the U.S. has 600 per 100,000 people, and here in the Netherlands we're at, I think, about 60 per 100,000 people. So it's just a wide, you know, the whole system is geared mm -hmm. towards incarceration. And then there's the racial element as well. Uh, again, I can only speak for Illinois, where I, I sit on the advisory board of the John Howard Association, and what we see is that we have 65% of our inmates are African American or black, and uh, that is disproportional to the amount of crime committed by the black community. So there's also a, a racial element that you know is pervasive in the in the U.S. system. Yeah, I, agree, a, I agree with all that. We have another question here. Hi, Ricky. Um, just wanted to say your story is so powerful, so thank you for sharing it. Um, you've probably, I'm sure, heard of the Central Park Five, and hearing about your case reminds me of elements of it. And um, there's the series that they made, When You See Us, where they're kind of showing what they went through, both in the trial and incarceration, and then life afterwards. And I think we think, oh, you're, you're free, 
but it seems like it's uh, so difficult to reintegrate into society. And how was that experience for you being, let's say, quote unquote, free, but restricted in so many ways, even just you saying that you didn't have a, like an, a piece of ID and I'm just trying to survive in a new world 39 years later. Um, I was for, more fortunate than most because I had a great support, support system as far as the Ohio Innocence Project was concerned. I mean, I, I shudder to think what my life would have been like if these guys hadn't been there for me. And so in that respect, um, uh, I can elaborate a little, but uh, I know that a lot of exonerees and just guys in general getting out of prison don't have that kind of support, and it's doubly hard being a convicted felon to integrate back into society, or even an exoneree. Uh, a lot of exonerees are still suffering and struggling, you know, to integrate back into society and have, get back to a normal life. So it isn't an easy task, um, even if you have the means financially to do it, you know, you still need that social and moral structure that a lot of these guys don't have. I remember Ricky telling me after he was out for a couple months, um, you know, I have a hard time connecting with people because I have no history. Like I go to an event and everybody can talk about things that they remember and last year's Super Bowl and, you know, this, that and the other. And I feel like an outsider because I don't, I can't say, oh yeah, I remember that. I just don't have a history. My history is in prison. And I can tell that that's changed. I mean, can you talk about that a little bit? It, it has. It was, you know, it's like an outsider. <clears throat> like I was imposing, like I was an outsider. Even, even among family, we would be at family gatherings and people would break out pictures and be laughing and talking about, you know, and I would be pretending like I'm laughing, but I had no clue what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> you know, because I was in prison. But um, it's just those kind of incidents, you know, um, not having that past and that connection with people in general. But um, like I said earlier, uh, I've, been, I've been out and uh, had a chance to make my own memories. And so that's kind of eased the discomfort of being in social gatherings with my family and friends and, you know, just discussing stuff like that. You know, it doesn't bother me as much because I have similar and like memories to reflect on now when they're talking. It might be, not be the same memories, but I remember the time I was on a roller coaster and I was scared or whatever they might be talking about or the time I fell in the, off the boat fishing, you know. <clears throat> but it's a difficult journey, but it's one that one can navigate if you had a proper support, you know. We have room for two or three more questions. So if you want to go, go for it now. <laughs> And Mickey's in the back, and that gentleman was first. Very, ins very inspiring. Thank you. Quick question. <clears throat> Ricky and his friends didn't do it. Did they ever find out who did do it? Um, no, and unfortunately, um, I always think about that. Um, I think about the family that lost their loved one um, a lot, and I often, when I speak, I speak about the family and how nobody ever went to that family and apologized or said, sorry, we got it wrong. Um, and from what I understand, you know, this is back in the 70s, and um, the father is the head of the household. He's the breadwinner. He's the glue that holds the family together. And at that time, he had two sons, I do believe, and a wife. And when they lost their dad, you know, that kind of shattered their family. I learned later on, after I got out of prison, um, one of the relatives of the, the, the victim's family got in touch with me, and um, I was kind of apprehensive about meeting this lady. I thought she was going to blow up on me because I was out of prison, but it was just the opposite. She was like, I'm so sorry this happened to you. And so we had a conversation, and I asked about the family, and she said, um, after their dad died, things, the family just kind of fell apart, you know. One of the sons succumbed to drugs and the other one ended up in prison and the mother died of a broken heart. And um, it's just a tragedy, you know, an unnecessary tragedy that um, nobody on the authority side of it at least went to this, these people and said, sorry we got it wrong. Um, and I try to keep that family in my mind and in my talks always. We have room for one more. Who wants to go for it? Mika. Hi. 
Hi, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm also completely speechless. I have a question for Ricky. Um, how you mentioned that you had a lot of anxiety, obviously. Um, I was going to ask you if you had anyone to talk to uh, when you were in, but of course, 23 hours in the in the cell, I assume not. But how did how did you deal with that anxiety? You really have to get to know who you are. You know, you really have to be honest with yourself and get to know who you are to understand your strengths and weaknesses not, and not be afraid to admit that you're afraid to yourself. I used to have daily and nightly dialogues with myself and um, I think in those moments um, serving that time like that I really got to know who I was, know my, my strengths and weaknesses, but it's really about self-dialogue. I mean, you get to talk to people, and if you have outside support like family, you get visits. Um, but no one's in that cell with you, and you know, and you have to learn to get along with yourself and to be at peace sometimes, you know, and sometimes even accept your surroundings and your situation, you know. I don't want to stop. Let's do one more, and that's really the last <laughs> yeah. one. <laughs> uh, yeah, you go for it, Mika. Yeah, well, you have to mic. <laughs> okay. Who well, has a question? <laughs> I read one time that uh, the state of Louisiana spends more on the prison system than on education. And I was just wondering, you know, just uh, Mr. Jackson, you, uh, you faced, you know, the... Uh, uh, the uh, law, you know, the uh, uh, prison system as it's, you know, as, it's you know, as it's structured in the state of Ohio. Would it have been very different, you know, if you had been in a different state? Uh, you know, many of us, you know, tend to think that, you know, the level of justice as it is, as it is administered in the north would be quite different from the south, for example. Um, that's a good question, but in the time that I was convicted, um, I tend to think that no, my plight would have pretty much been the same, irregardless of where I might have been in the United States.